Good evening and welcome to the month of October Domestic Violence Awareness Month that involves families, communities, and children. I am Dr. Nina Epen. I'm the co uh, chair for the Family Ministries at the Southern Asian Seventh-day Adventist Church. And we, as the Family Ministries, we are very much dedicated to the welfare of the families and the children of, uh, in our congregation. So Dr. Joshi, we are really happy to have you, especially as a subject matter expert. Um, we would like you to Tell us something about you and how you are connected to this topic today. Sure. Thank you so much for having me. As you mentioned, October is Domestic Abuse Awareness Month. And any effort that we can take to increase awareness about this pretty uh, potent and uh, in many ways a pernicious issue that impacts our communities is really, really important. Uh, my name is Chetan Joshi. I currently serve as a director of the University of Maryland's Counseling Center. Uh, I'm licensed as a psychologist in the state of Maryland, have a PhD in counseling psychology, uh, but, and I'm originally from India. Um, so again, pleasure to be here. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Again, Dr. Joshi Chaitan, <laughs> we are really happy to have you here. Of course. Um, so one of the first questions that I would like to ask you is about the signs and types of domestic violence that individuals and families should be aware of. Okay, sure. So even before I kind of talk more about the signs and the specific types of domestic abuse, what I'd like to say is a couple of general principles, right? Uh, first and foremost, it's really, really important to remember that domestic abuse does not see any categories, meaning that regardless of your class, regardless of your gender, regardless of your ethnicity, uh, regardless of your sexual orientation, what have you, uh, domestic abuse is something that is seen regardless of what your background is, right? It can impact any one of us, mm -hmm. and it's a very common issue that impacts uh, our society and, uh, uh, and, and people in general. Uh, having said that, uh, domestic abuse, again, when we think of domestic abuse, we tend to think about physical violence or physical abuse. We tend to think about sexual violence, sexual abuse. Uh, but we have to understand domestic abuse as, as, basically, um, as basically existing within this larger umbrella of uh, issues related to power and control in intimate relationships. Um, and what happens oftentimes is... Uh, it's essentially domestic abuses where one person in an intimate relationship is trying to get power and control over the other person's life. Uh, and this is done through various means. It is done through physical violence. It is done through sexual violence. It is done through financial uh, control and power. It is done through emotional abuse, psychological abuse. Uh, it can also be achieved through, uh, through threatening behaviors. It can also be done through holding kids in some ways uh, um, as hostage in an abuse situation. So really domestic abuse actually, uh, the way it functions is it, is it is a behavior that's expressed to all of these different means. Now, oftentimes what happens is that uh, the physical violence or the sexual violence uh, happens and oftentimes that sets the stage where the person who's being abused uh, then feels really afraid of something like that happening again. Uh, and so the physical violence, sexual violence may happen multiple times or one, of, one or two times, but all of these other things that I mentioned with emotional abuse, with holding kids hostage, uh, threatening things, financial abuse, isolation, all of those things are happening on an ongoing basis and constitute like the overall picture of what domestic abuse looks like. Um, the other thing uh, that I also, it's, uh, that's also important to remember is when it comes to domestic abuse and violence, uh, that usually the whole uh, situation follows this particular cycle. There's a particular pattern to how domestic abuse and violence actually uh, comes about. Uh, and if you look at, and you can Google this, if you look at any of these common sites, you'll find that uh, the cycle of domestic violence usually happens in three or four stages. Mm -hmm. um, the first and foremost stage is called as the tension building phase, 
where uh, you as a person who is being abused, uh, you know, constantly feel like you feel like you have to uh, walk on eggshells around the person who is the abuser. You're not really quite sure what you've done wrong. You're not quite sure what is contributing to the increased sense of tension in the relationship. But something is going on that causes you to always be careful around that person. Uh, something is going on that causes you to always be afraid of the person. Uh, and so the tension is, being, is, is constantly building up. And it could be small things. It could be build, big things. Uh, I have, I've worked with cases where simple things like a husband and wife driving together to go on a trip and the wife, for example, is driving, basically loses um, direction. That causes the husband to then get upset, right? So that's a tension building thing. Uh, so again, the first phase oftentimes in the domestic violence cycle is this tension building phase uh, happening by, for, by, for, as a result of a variety of different reasons. Followed by this, usually the tension building usually then leads to the actual explosion or the actual uh, 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 actual event where the domestic uh, violence are, uh, happens. And again, this could be physical violence, this could be sexual violence, uh, and so the tension, be, uh, tension building kind of leads into the actual violence phase. And following the violence phase, usually there is a phase where the person goes into this, uh, where the abuser uh, and the abuse go into this phase of reconciliation where the person who's actually the abuser might actually apologize for the abuse, may promise that the abuse will never happen again. And uh, that leads to this perceived false sense of safety for the person who's being abused. Uh, that usually then leads into a period of calm, uh, but then pretty quickly you get back into the stage where the tension starts building up and it, this entire cycle that gets repeated. Over time, what happens is uh, the tension buildup happens very, very quickly. The abuse and the actual physical violence, sexual violence happens, you know, pretty intensely. The severity increases mm -hmm. and the period of reconciliation starts to decrease in time. And there's really not a whole lot of calm that's there, right? So the cycle becomes faster, it becomes more severe. Mm -hmm. And it's a very pernicious and a very difficult and dangerous situation because eventually what this could lead to is serious injury. It could lead to even death of the person who's being abused. So again, it's a very, very important and very difficult uh, issue uh, that we should be considering and uh, you know, thinking about. Thank you. In fact, uh, I was going to talk to you about the cycle of violence and you already addressed this. Um, so when I was listening to you um, in your conversation, I noticed that you brought children and wife. Mm -hmm. So, considering them as vulnerable people, mm -hmm. do you see or are the statistics showing more uh, the domestic violence subjects are children and females or wife? Sure. And if so, how we as families can create a safe environment mm -hmm for these children, mm -hmm. and how can we address this? At the same time, you said in this phase, there is the tension building phase, and then there is the actual explosion mm -hmm. phase, mm -hmm. and then reconciliation, mm -hmm. as you're going to feel bad that what happened, and you're going to reconcile. But this is going to repeat. Mm -hmm. It's not going to stop there. That's right. And so there's personality disorder has anything to do with this um, individuals who does this? Sure. So multiple questions over here. I'll begin with the first question that you asked. So as I mentioned before, um, domestic abuse is something that is seen in all relation is seen in all relations, regardless of you know, regardless of your gender, sexual orientation, religious background, cultural background, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Nobody is immune from this uh, uh, pretty potent and difficult issue. Uh, having said that, what we typically see, as far as statistics are concerned, research is concerned, is that it's usually that women uh, tend to be usually the people who are abused, and usually males tend to be the aggressors. Mm -hmm. uh, and so that's just statistically what we currently see. Uh, it's also important to note that domestic abuse doesn't only happen 
in a relationship where there's marriage. Uh, it can happen in uh, dating relationships. It can happen sometimes in really close friendships. Uh, so again, it's important to remember that this can impact any kind of relationship. But most commonly, we see this kind of domestic abuse situation in dating relationships and in relationships with marriages there. Right? Mm -hmm. um, in terms of impacting children, what we typically see is not that the children themselves are being abused in you know the domestic abuse typically happens between the husband and wife mm -hmm. between the partner uh, what oftentimes is seen is that children happen to be present and tend to be used by the abuser against the person who's being abused right uh, so for example uh, the abuser might say to the person being abused, to the victim, that, you know, if you don't do what I'm asking you to do, then I'm going to do something to the kids, right? So threatening the kids as a way to get the, uh, the victim uh, to listen and do what the abuser wants to do. Uh, it could happen uh, that uh, as the situation continues, if it indeed goes to a level where uh, a court intervention is happening, uh, the abuser might use the kids as a way to say, if you do this, if you move forward with taking action and uh, you know stopping this, uh, then I'm going to take the kids away from you. Mm. Uh, I'm going to fight for custody and I'm going to go in that direction. Uh, and so again, all of this, this threat towards kids, either uh, threat of physical violence towards kids uh, or threat of uh, you know taking them away, all of them are designed to exercise power and control over the victim. Mm. Uh, and that's how oftentimes you'll find that victims get stay put and get stuck in the relationship because they're afraid of what might happen if they speak up or if they take action, right? Uh, the other question that you asked towards the end was, uh, do we typically see people who have personality issues uh, or personality disorders who engage in this kind of behavior? Now, personality disorders are a set of disorders uh, that are, it's, it's a category unto itself in the DSM-5. Um, and I would say typically that there isn't really an overlap between uh, people who have personality issues and people who engage in domestic violence situations. Certainly there might be a minor overlap, but typically what I see with domestic abuse stuff uh, is that you don't necessarily have to have a personality disorder mm -hmm. for you to be a person who does, you know, who engages in this kind of, you know, difficult and horrible behavior towards a partner. Thank you. Um, so when you talked about this, um, one of the things that came to my mind is if you as a child yes. has grown up in a family mm -hmm. where you have seen um, you know, somebody in the family is being abused or your father has abused your mom, do you think that has an effect on you mm -hmm. to continue that behavior? This is what I have seen. Mm -hmm. And so will that have an effect on the child? Yes, absolutely, absolutely. So growing up in an environment, children need an environment where they feel safe, where there is uh, respect for all individuals in the family, where there is open communication, where there is acceptance, where uh, there is just flexibility. All of those things need to be in an environment for a child to feel safe. And when you are, when a child is a part of a family where there is domestic abuse, violence going on, all of those things don't, none of those things really exist in that environment. So as a kid going, growing up in that kind of an environment, you will absolutely be impacted hmm. by the situation that's going on, by the abuse that you see occurring in front of your eyes. And it could really lead to multiple reactions as you grow up. Uh, it could lead uh, the, uh, the child to a place where uh, they are very disengaged and wa don't want to be engaged in any kind of relationship at all just because of what they've seen with their parents. Uh, or it could lead them to a place where they are very timid, very shy, very fearful uh, of being in relationships. Uh, there are certainly certain certain situations where if you have grown up in abuse situations uh, that you might actually end up being an abuser yourself. That can certainly happen as well. Uh, so really, it depends upon individual personality of the child as to how they're going to react to what they see. Uh, and all of these different possibilities exist. Uh, the biggest key over here, uh, if you're a child who's grown up in this kind of an environment, is 
really taking the time to gain some self-awareness, to try and understand what you witness, to get into treatment, to get into therapy, so that you have a clear understanding of what you witness, what your relationship to what you witness was, gaining self-awareness, and based off of that self-awareness and understanding, then you know being able to move in the direction of establishing healthy relationships. Okay. So basically what you're saying is, this has a lasting impact on Absolutely. the children or the child who witnesses domestic violence. Absolutely. So in an environment like that, how can we create an open communication? Is there a way that we can address the issue? In a situation where domestic abuse is occurring? Correct. So, you know, that question assumes that the abuser and the victim, uh, especially the abuser, has a level of self-awareness or has a level of understanding of what they're doing. Now, they do have an understanding of what they're doing. They want to exercise power and control over the victim, which is why they're engaging in that behavior. But oftentimes, there is no incentive to step away from that behavior, right? If I can get my partner, especially if I'm, of that, if I'm the, of that mindset, and if I can get my partner to do exactly what I want and get the power and feeling of power and control that I get from it, then what is my incentive to stop doing that, right? So that question assumes that that person is, has a level of understanding, self-awareness uh, that they need to have in order to be able to then step away from it uh, to order to move in a direction where they're creating this kind of a healthy environment for kids. So rather than going with that question or rather than explore, what I would say is that if you are, if, you know, if you're a family where the situation of domestic abuse violence is, ha is, is happening, uh, it's really, really important for friends and family of the family where this is happening to uh, to, uh, to closely observe, to understand what's going on, to see what's going on, uh, and to intervene whenever and wherever possible. Mm -hmm. Any and all support that you can provide to the victim, that you can provide to the kids who are growing up in the situation, either by removing them from the environment, providing support, taking them to your home, uh, so that they can have some level of stability, all of those things are important. And as far as the victim is concerned, the biggest, biggest thing that I always, um, you know, stress when you're, say, for example, a, um, a victim of domestic abuse, if they come to you, the biggest thing that you can do is to just listen to them and believe them, right? Mm -hmm. Oftentimes, this domestic abuse stuff is so pernicious and is so um, subtle and at the same time in your face in so many different ways, it leaves the person, the victim, feeling disoriented. Mm -hmm. It leaves the person feeling afraid uh, for the life, for the life of their children. And the biggest thing that they need for you to do as a person that they come to seeking help is for you to just listen, be there, and just believe what they're saying, right? Because if under those circumstances you move to a place where you're questioning, uh, if you're uh, moving to a place where you're judging them for what's happening, it's going to quickly shut them down and it's going to push them in the direction of being in that cycle, stuck in that cycle. So again, the biggest thing that you can do if a victim comes to you or if a family member who's possibly experiencing this comes to you is to believe them, is to validate what they're experiencing. Once you've listened to them, once you've validated, once you've communicated to them that you believe what they're, what they're saying, then you can move in the direction of figuring out what is the best way moving forward. And the same applies to kids, right? Mm -hmm. It may not be the victim who comes to you and talks to you Correct. about the fact that there is abuse happening in their family, yeah. right? It might be the child who comes and tells you that. Mm -hmm. It might be a child who comes and tells you that they saw the mom hit the dad, uh, so the dad hit the mom, right? Again, in those situations, the biggest thing you can do even for the child is to sit with them, listen to them, believe them, validate, and once that has happened, you can move in the direction of figuring out what is the best way to help the family, to help the kid. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So this is a very sensitive topic, yes. especially you and I coming from an Indian cultural mm -hmm. background, mm -hmm where we tend to keep all these things within the families. That's right. And we think that this is a stigma. Mm -hmm. We don't want to talk to anybody what is going on within the family. That's right. So they try to shut down the path where they are able to go mm -hmm. and reach out for help. Mm -hmm. Now, are there 
uh, resources or communication pathways that the children can use to let others know what is going on. Mm -hmm. So for children who might be experienced, and again, this is difficult, right? So let me just say, even before I answer the question, that being able to speak up about this is not an easy thing to do. And also the biggest thing to remember is that domestic violence, domestic abuse thrives in silence. Yes. The more the abuser is able to get everybody concerned to be silent, secretive about what's going on in the family, the greater the domestic abuse is going to, is, the, the more the domestic abuse is going to continue, right? So this is not easy to talk about. But the best thing to that I have to suggest in situations like this is if as a kid, you have a family member or a church member or a school administrator or a friend or anybody that you trust that you feel secure with if you have someone like that in in your environment i, I highly encourage you to speak up to talk to them about this person that you trust about what you've seen that could be the first step to then getting you to a place where you get the help where you get the family the help that you need Right. So again, identify that one person. It just has to be one person. It might be the pastor. It might be anybody from the church community. Identify that one person that you feel like you trust, that you feel safe with and speak up. Let them know what's going on in your household and they can help them move uh, you in the direction where, you, uh, where the family can get some intervention, where there can be some therapy that can happen or whatever is needed in order to address the situation. Thank you for that. You really addressed some of the ways that we can help, especially um, since we are a religious organization mm -hmm. and we have different ministries that are involved in helping the mm -hmm. families and also for the children and for the young adults. Um, you brought out a very good point that creating an environment where the kids or the uh, family member is able to openly communicate mm -hmm. and then talk and then believing what they are saying is true and act on it. That's exactly right. The, the, the piece about believing what the person is saying. The same goes, I say the same thing we have, you know, I work with several women who've been sexually assaulted, etc., etc. The biggest thing that you can do in helping a victim is, and the first step is believe what they're saying. They have absolutely no reason to lie about what's going on. And just the act of you believing, hearing them out, goes a long way towards starting them on this journey of healing. Thank you. Um, so as we say, education mm -hmm. is a powerful tool. Mm -hmm. Are there some practical ways our community can educate both adults and children about healthy relationships mm -hmm. and conflict resolution? Mm -hmm. And do you have some resources that you recommend for our congregation? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I believe that the work that all of you are doing over here in the family ministry as a part of this church is incredibly important. Thank you. Uh, the work that you're doing in uh, talking to families about all of the different well-being related things like you talked about financial well-being, you talked about relationship well. So all of the work that you're doing is exactly what you should be doing to increase awareness about how to build, build healthy relationships, about what a healthy family looks like, about what kind of environment your children need in order to thrive. So I, you know, kudos to you. I encourage you to continue doing the good work that you're doing. Having said that, there are actually multiple resources online uh, from, uh, from the National, uh, from NIH, from NIMH, uh, from the American Psychological Association. A lot of different resources exist that if you just Google uh, about domestic violence, uh, healthy relationships, healthy families, you'd be able to find a wealth of information uh, that you can use. Similarly though, if you are in a situation where uh, you are actually experiencing this abuse and you want to get to a place where you are wanting to move out of this abuse. Uh, there's also a lot of different treatment resources that are available. Uh, the biggest thing again is in those cases, talk to somebody that you trust, talk to your pastor, talk to you know uh, a family, uh, a person that you can trust and they can help you get connected to the resources that uh, you know that can help in these situations. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So my husband, Joe, and myself, we are um, advocates for family ministry. Mm -hmm. 
what advice do you have for us and for even the caregivers um, to build the strong, loving relationship in the families? And we want to do something constructive. Sure. Um, not really accusing anybody, mm -hmm. but at the same time, we want to bring an awareness. Mm -hmm. Sometimes the person who is doing this domestic violence, yes, you said the person, it could be the power. Mm -hmm. He wants to show who is mm -hmm. powerful in this relationship, mm -hmm. or it could be something else that he, that is going on within him. Mm -hmm. um, so what is the best way we can make it more effective among our families mm -hmm. in a constructive way we want to help the families when you're dealing with a family where domestic abuse violence might be happening it's really first of all it's really really important as people who are in the roles that you occupy to observe and understand what's going on right also understand that the abuser certainly the abuser is never going to want to give up the abusive relationship unless mm -hmm. they have a certain level of understanding and reflection, in which case they would not have been doing this in the first place. But more importantly, that oftentimes the victims also requires a significant amount of period before they get psychologically to a place where they are ready to leave or act on leaving or act on leaving the relationship, right? So observing what's going on, trying to understand where things are in that particular family, where is the victim, how safe is the victim, how safe are the kids, is the victim ready to, uh, uh, psychologically at a place where they are ready to take the steps needed to get out of the situation, is really, really important as a first step, right? Now, depending upon where the family is, where the victim is, then it's really, really important to engage the victim in a conversation mm -hmm. about what are some potential ways in which you can help, right? Again, this conversation needs to happen in an environment where they feel safe, where they feel trust. It should be in an environment where the abuser is not present. Uh, so if you're able to pull the person aside, you know, and have a separate individual, you know, uh, private conversation with them about what you've observed, what you're seeing, right, is really, really important. So having that conversation with the victim is really important. And again, remember, just because you've had the conversation doesn't automatically mean that the person might be ready to leave. In fact, oftentimes, and this is the biggest challenge as a psychologist, as somebody who works with uh, violence, uh, domestic abuse, violence victims, oftentimes, the hardest thing for me to sit with that you're going to find as well is oftentimes the victims are not psychologically in a place because they're afraid, because they fear for their safety. They're not in a place where they're ready to leave the relationship immediately, mm. right? A lot of this requires a lot of patience. So it's really, really important as helpers to be patient, to keep on having the conversation. It's not a one and done situation. You're going to have to continue talking to them. You're going to have to continue checking in with the victim, how things are going. And the hope is, is that through having that conversation, through checking in, through having that continued dialogue, you'll hopefully be able to move that person to a place where they see what's going on because oftentimes that itself is hard for somebody who has been victimized in this way to understand how wrong this is, to understand how ridiculous it is that our abuser is controlling and overpowering them in this way. That itself takes a long time, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So engaging them in a conversation in the hope that eventually they get to the place where they start to gain some level of objectivity understand how ridiculous and bad this the situation is, how dangerous the situation is for them, for their kids, right? Getting them to that place might take some, might, might take some time, might take a lot of patience, but once they are there, then you can start talking to them about what are some resources that are available, what are some treatments that are available, mm -hmm. what are some things that they can do. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it's not even about treatment, right? Treatment is, you know, later on, the first and foremost thing that you can do is to ensure that you get them to a place of safety. It might require police intervention, it might require court intervention, it might require some significant level of intervention to get the victim and the kids away from the situation, right? It might require the abuser to go in jail, mm -hmm. right? So again, ensuring the person's safety, the kid's safety is the first and foremost important. And once all of that has happened, once they are in a place where they're safe, away from the abuser, then the work of recovery can start. 
So key points to remember, again, remember that the person might not be ready or understanding and have objectivity about the situation they're in. So being patient with them, engaging them in a conversation on an ongoing basis, talking to them, et cetera, et cetera, and eventually getting them to a place where they can move towards all of the uh, positive outcomes that I've talked about is important. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Dr. Chetan Joshi. <laughs> I have learned a lot from you. Thank you. Uh, thank you for um, opening up to us a lot of uh, things that we can do mm -hmm. as a congregation to our community mm -hmm. um, where we can engage our families in an open discussion mm -hmm. and also at the same time create a safe environment. We want to make sure that they feel safe. That's right this is going to be a place where they can come and talk. Mm -hmm. And also confidentiality is mm -hmm. another important factor mm -hmm. in this. So I want to make sure that this evening, whoever is listening to us and whoever is watching us, you're all going to be blessed by this particular topic. And let's work together to make sure that we create a safe environment for our families and children, not just within our community, but outside of this space too. Thank you so much, Dr. Joshi, once again from Family Ministries and also on behalf of our Southern Asian Seventh-day Adventist Church. Thank you for taking your time and coming. And thank you so much for having me. Uh, always ready to help. Uh, thank you so much. Thank mm -hmm. you.